Well, good morning to you, FCC, and I just want to say welcome. Um, we uh, are glad to have you in the service today, and I, I want to say from the bottom of my heart, uh, just as Robbie already brought attention to it, if you did get one of those scammer emails from me that looked like me and tried to represent me, I, in fact, I had no idea. They, they were asking and requesting for what they called, um, what was it? Steam gift cards. I had to look it up. I was thinking the only thing I could think is like in connection with Steam is like Steamy. So I was almost reluctant to look it up. But I looked it up and it's video games. I, I don't even play video games. And uh, so somebody on that was trying to represent me was asking people in our church family for Steam gift cards. Um, so if it doesn't come from my regular email address, you can just ignore it. On the flip side, I, I wanted to let you know, if you do want to give me a gift card directly, um, I'm certainly not opposed to that, and uh, I'm just kidding you, I'm just yanking your chain, but um, anyway, I just wanted to let you know that. We're in this series, if you happen to be a guest and you're in the service today, we've been doing a summer series uh, on the book of Romans, we're turning the corner in a different direction. And we've got this um, passage of scripture that we've been memorizing. Allison is going to say it for us. And uh, I, I want you to just turn your uh, Allison as a part of our unlimited ministry. You got a microphone there, Robbie? Good deal. And uh, it is Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And I hope that you've been putting it to memory because we want you to internalize God's word. In fact, we'll actually talk about that a little bit later in the service. So, Allison, would you do us the favor of repeating this verse for us? Yeah. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed of this world, but be transferred from the renew of your mind. Amen. Thank you so much. Would you express your appreciation to Allison? Um. I happened to be out, uh, Pastor Kevin gave the message here last weekend, and I was out at our Southwest campus, and uh, I interacted with a guy before the service began out there, and uh, he told me, he said, uh, and I, I won't use his name to protect his guilt, and um, he, was, he was telling me this, he said, my wife came to me not long ago and said, uh, you've been complaining and belly aching about this, you've been criticizing this, on and on the list went, and, and he said, she finally looked at me and said, you have become a grumpy individual. And he said, uh, I realized I was a grumpy individual. And I sent him a text the first part of the week, and I said, uh, are you being grumpy? I'm praying for your grumpiness. And, and chances are, whether it's being grumpy, whether it's uh, anger issues, maybe you're in the service today and you're a worry wart, maybe you're in the service and you're anxious about some aspect of your health, that there's something that's in your life that, that the way you're thinking and the way you're looking at and perceiving life right now, you wish things would be different. Could be a relationship, could be something that's going on at work, could be some conflict you've got with a neighbor. Chances are you need to be changed and transformed. In fact, I, I was thinking about it as I was driving down 81 today to get here. There are things that the Holy Spirit has brought into my mind, into my heart, that I know need to be changed and transformed. And so whether it's grumpiness, anger, worry, whatever it might be, how many of you, without a raising of hands, just give me a nod, are there some things that you would like to see changed about your life? Would you just acknowledge that by nodding your head? Tyler, several of you are so bold, you're just going ahead and raising your hand even though I didn't ask for a show of hands. Everything that we've been looking at in the book of Romans talks about how we perceive and view life. Chapters 1 through 11 talk about what it is that we believe. All the things. Think, think, think about everything about ourselves, about how we're guilty before God. Because remember in chapter 3, verse 23, it says this, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then there we go from feeling very, very guilty to the potential of living under grace because Romans 5, 8 says, but God shows his love to us in that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the good news. Let, let, let me just stop here and make a, a, a side note that you will never respond fully and become the kind of individual if you're living under guiltiness. It's all about God's grace. Um, 
earlier in Paul's letter to the Romans, he says this, it's God's kindness that leads you to repentance. I, I mean, you can live every day of your life. Some of you are in this service today and you feel guilty about what you've said, about what you've done. Maybe it was last night, last week, 10 years ago. Nobody else still knows about it. And you're feeling guilty about this. And the real issue is this, just deal with it and experience God's grace and forgiveness. And there is this pattern in regard to our minds. We believe one thing, and what it does is it will lead us in a particular direction because the things that need to be transformed, in fact, that's, that's the key word for today is transformation. You're needing transformation in terms of some attitude, some action, some way in which you need God's intervention in your life. And so the belief ends up impacting the way that you behave. You, you are where you are right now in life. You have the habits. You have the dysfunction. You have the patterns of behavior. All because, and it starts down here with believe. Now, it was, it was pretty interesting because Pastor Wes is preaching out at our north campus, Pastor John at our southwest campus. Wes made a pretty good observation, and he says this. In fact, we've used the term. Kevin used it last weekend in his message. And he says uh, behavior modification. What, what is behavior modification? Beha behavior modification is very simply this. It's like when we tell our, you, our preschoolers, now you need to behave. And sometimes the starting point for us is we're trying to be good without thinking correctly. And we'll actually end up doing this. We'll, we'll, we'll get it going in this direction. So we start with our behavior and then eventually we get to the point where we'll say, Wow, now, now I really need to turn to the way that I think and I need to make sure that I get this correctly understood. So don't, don't end up doing the converse of this. Realize 11 chapters have been spent on how we believe, how we think, how we look at life. Then he's going to spend chapters 12 through 16 looking at behavior. So make sure you get this in the right order. Now, if you're not fully convinced that your beliefs will impact your behavior. Let me give you a little story. Uh, back several weeks ago, my son-in-law were out in Catawba and we were cutting some wood and, and uh, in this brush, Derek saw about a two-foot copperhead. And uh, so it made me, it is, ever since then, it's made me paranoid. I hadn't seen any poison snakes on our property, but it's made me po uh, very paranoid. And so I have all my steel-toed boots, and I have on my chaps, and I have on my Kevlar gloves, and I have my helmet on that not only protects me from the chainsaw noise, but also a face shield and everything, and I'm like, so I'm just really limiting the places that a snake can bite me. Now, how many of you are like me, you have a real disdain for snakes? How many of you follow that? Okay, a bunch of you. I, I don't like snakes. Uh, I'm finding that everything that there is that, you know, up there, that if it's in a pile of brush or whatever, I either jiggle it with my foot or whatever and uh, so I was up there a few days ago and I was with my youngest son Jake and we were doing some cutting so I had on all my gear and I was cutting with my chainsaw and uh, I, I wanted to kick and make sure this log was okay and that there wasn't anything a snake that was lying underneath this log and so I kicked this log it was an old rotten log and it split open and inside the log there was a snake Now, you're imagining all kinds of things. It was just a little bitty snake. <laughs> but it was still a snake. And uh, I said, where'd it go? And uh, I had jumped back, and uh, Jake said, I don't know. He said, is that it? I said, no, I think it's a leaf. And I, I didn't know what else to do. I, ha I had my chainsaw fired up, and I was like, I'll take care of it. It was like, boom, 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 boom. I was cutting all down through that log. I'm like, I'm not taking any chances. So... You know, I was telling some of the other guys on staff about this, and Robbie Willard said, it probably was just a big worm. <laughs> I was like, no, nah, I'm, I'm convinced it was a snake. Now, my belief, my disdain for snakes led to a behavior. In fact, it's pretty interesting because my son Jake said, Dad, I have never seen you move that fast. Like, you jumped back from that log. That's why I lost sight of the snake, worm, whatever it was. And... Uh, and I'm thinking our, our beliefs, how we think, will always lead to the behavior in our lives. And I want you to realize, as you've come into the service, you can leave this service a changed person, transformed by the power of the gospel. And what we see in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, you don't have to live. Some of you have been, you've become so contented and so frustrated. You, you, there, 
you can have a new normal, but you've become so accustomed to the sin or the pattern of behavior in your life, the dysfunction of the past, the bitterness, whatever it is that seems to have plagued you, the addiction, and you honestly, deep down, don't think things could be any different for you. But I, I want you to know, if you change your belief and you do what is found, you can unlock the door to seeing your life radically transformed. So I want to read for you. I hope you'll take some notes and record because this could be extremely valuable to you. I want to read to you. Uh, Allison has already quoted to us a portion of verse 2, but I want to read to you the whole passage of Scripture. And then we're going to go back and look at four insights in it. And I hope you'll follow along in your copy of the Scriptures and also take some notes. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. In fact, Anytime you see the word therefore, you ought to ask the question, what's it there for? He's building the case that everything that we've seen in chapters 1 through 11 now is turning the corner in a different direction to the behaviors. I appeal, in fact, every commentator I read said, this is not just a therefore as to what's found in chapters like 10 and 11. It's everything that we find in the first portion of his letter. By the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Well, let's go back and let's look at, let's break it down. I love when we have these shorter texts because it gives us the opportunity to dig in a little bit deeper rather than a more superficial study. First insight that we're going to see this. True, heartfelt, genuine transformation in my life and yours is going to start this way. It bases itself on the mercies of God. Bases itself on the mercies of God. Everything that Paul has said up to this point is about the great mercy of God. That we're guilty, but God has shown us His grace that if we'll respond to it, our lives can be radically changed. Uh, First part of verse 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers... By the mercies of God. The mercies of God. We, we, we sang about that. April led us in a song just a few minutes ago about He's worthy. He's forgiving. He's gracious. He's kind. He has loved us so much. That's why He went to Calvary's cross. And, and the only way you're going to first and foremost be able to be transformed is when you fully understand and grasp the mercies of God. The mercy of God is shown to us in forgiving our sin. The mercy of God is shown to us by adopting us into his family. The mercy of God is shown through his indwelling spirit. You remember when we looked at chapter 7 and we're frustrated. We, we do things we don't want to do. We don't end up doing the things that we should do. And we're frustrated. And he says, hey, I'm going to give to you. There is victory and power. And not only what Jesus did on the cross, but also through the indwelling of my spirit, that it's not willpower, it's his power through his spirit that resides in our lives. All of these things, he's been building everything, therefore, by the mercies of God, this is how you respond, this is how you act. Complimentary passage of scripture, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. Wonderful passage, let's put it on the screen. I want us to read this together, read along with me, let's say it out loud. God, being rich in mercy... Because of the great love with which he loved us. Rich in what? Rich in mercy. If you want to be transformed, if I want to be transformed, first of all, that's why saturate your mind. Visualize. Think about on a regular daily basis the mercy of God that you've been given through what Jesus did for us on the cross. That's why when we observe the Lord's Supper, we don't just want to go through the motions of a ritual we want it to really sink in the sacrifice that he made the shedding of his blood the giving of his body on calvary's cross that's that's the starting point that's the foundation mercy is my primary motivation in life but mercy leads to something second point is this it responds with an act of worship responds with an act of worship i was rc sproul uh passed away about a year and a half ago and he was a great pastor and theologian and Uh, scholar, and uh, one of the things that stood out as I was listening to a message that he had given on this particular text, he says this, sacrifice is not about losing something, it's about expressing something. That's a good word. Uh, He's he's got it right. He nailed it. Notice uh, the second part of verse 1, it says, based on this, based on the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living 
sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. In other words, if you want to be a person, sometimes we think about, well, worship is when we sing or worship, we come to a service. Worship is the totality of your whole life, the way you think, the way that you live, the way you interact with other people. And we have to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice to God. Do you do that on an ongoing basis? Uh, there, there never should be a day that passes that we're not saying, God, I, I, I lay everything on the altar before you. Now, look, let me go back and let me give you some explanations of several of these phrases. First of all, it is spiritual worship. In, in your copy of the scriptures, spiritual worship in the King James Version, it can be translated this way, reasonable worship. It also means this in the Greek, logical, rational, makes sense. It, it, in other words, this is the response mechanism that is, R.C. Sproul said, it, it is expressing something that we realize we ought to have grateful hearts, that we ought to want to yield to Him. That we're not responding out of guilt, we're responding out of God's grace so, shown to us through Jesus. And then it uses, present your body. Now, it's not talking about just the, the flesh, the bones, our skeletal structure, just our, in our humanity that we possess. It means the totality of everything that we are. It means our mind and our will and our emotions. Remember, Jesus was asked the question, what's the greatest command motor above everything else? And you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Everything that you are. And when he's using this word about the body, it simply means this. Sam Shoemaker, pastor of the last century, phrased it this way. said, to be a Christian means... To give as much of myself as I can to as much of Jesus Christ as I know. That's a good word. And then he uses, Paul uses this word that it's not just any old sacrifice. It's a living sacrifice. Living sacrifice means it's continual, that it's ongoing. You know, every day you have the option as to how you're going to get out of the bed on a daily basis. It reminds me of two different guys. One guy, every day he got up, he looked on the bright side of things, and it was like, good morning, Lord. And then there was another guy that he was always glass half empty and different things, and it was like, when he'd get out of the bed first thing in the morning, it was like, good Lord, it's morning. You have an option every single day. This, this living sacrifice, see, usually the connotation would have been in the Jewish mindset that when the priests offered that sacrifice, they'd lay it on the altar, and, and it was a dead sacrifice. No, we're living sacrifices. That Every day we have the option. There ought to be this continual, ongoing way in which we give ourselves to Christ to say, I lay my life on the altar. Everything about me, I, I give it to you. Paul would use this phrase. He said, I die daily. It's a conscious, willful decision, what he did on a daily basis in regard to giving his life. And then he uses this. We're using our life, presenting them based on God's mercy as a living sacrifice to God. What, when, when you first hear the word sacrifice, what do you usually think of? I, I think for the most part, it usually has, even in the Christian community, sad to say, it has a negative connotation. Well, I, I sacrificed. I went and worked with the preschoolers. I sacrificed and I showed up at church early to, you know, hand out programs. I, I make a sacrifice I gave to a capital campaign or I, I was generous with the missions offering. Regrettably, I think it's just sort of ingrained in us that we think of sacrifice as somehow depriving us of something else in our lives, but not this connotation, not this use of sacrifice. Not when we understand the mercies of God. We don't view it as a sacrifice. David Livingston was a missionary in the 1800s, and he was criticized by his hometown, London, England, about all the things that he was doing to be a missionary to the continent of Africa. But he, he said this, People talk of the sacrifice I have made of spending so much of my time in Africa. Can that be called sacrifice, which is simply paid back as a small part of the great debt owing to our God, which we can never repay? Is that a sacrifice which brings its own reward of healthful activity, the consciousness of doing good, peace of mind, and bright hope of a glorious destiny hereafter? Away with such a word, such a view, and such a thought. It is emphatically no sacrifice, say rather it is a privilege. 
That, that changes our understanding of the word sacrifice. In fact, I'd like for you to look at somebody close to you and just say, sacrifice is a privilege. And say it with emphasis, all right? This is why in our SOS, I, I, to my knowledge, I was the only individual that got to go around and visit every one of the six schools. And it was a joy. We had over 300 volunteers that were a part of Serve Our Schools last Saturday morning. And uh, as I drove around, I enjoyed seeing the smiles on the face. And by the way, I want you to know, you invested as a congregation, as FCC, over $10,000 to make a difference in our community and life here in the Roanoke Valley. And I commend you uh, for that, and we give God praise for that. But I, I began to hear, people weren't whining and belly aching like, well, I had to give up my Saturday morning. There's other things that I could have been doing. They didn't view it as a sacrifice. They viewed it as a privilege. I, I, I love Vicki Henderson. and She's just a hoot all the way around. But Vicki Henderson said this. It was so much fun serving and meeting new people. Sandra Wills said this. I enjoyed doing God's work today. Exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. See, how, how do you view sacrifice? Once we fully understand the mercies of God, we, we, we view, it. we don't lose anything. We're expressing something. Love, gratitude, the privilege to be a part of unlimited, the privilege to be a, a part of giving, the privilege to make a difference across the street and around the world. All the things that we think about. What a blessing. So number one, it bases itself, transformation, if you're going to truly be transformed, bases itself on the mercies of God. Number two, responds with an act of worship. And number three, depends on the renewal of your mind. I don't know if you, um, if you feel very creative. Sometimes I just, Beth was, we were driving down the road the other day and she said, oh look, it's like a dinosaur in the clouds. She said, do you see that T-Rex? And I was like, yeah, I do see it. Sometimes I've got a good imagination. And uh, I, the other week we had our three-year-old granddaughter Ellie over to the house and Beth had fixed these blueberry pancakes and Ellie was behind, beside me in the high chair and we were seated in the dining room at the table and I, I looked down at my plate of blueberry pancakes and, and I thought oh my gosh and, and I looked at it and th this is what I saw and it <laughs> like the butter was the hair and two little eyes and I turned around my piece of sausage and I made this little tin and and I'm thinking man I, I need to have like my own emoji or something you know <laughs> When you and I, the, the real battle takes place in our minds. This whole passage is going to begin to talk about that the way that you're transformed. You're either going to be conformed or you're going to be transformed. And the battle's won in your mind. Proverbs chapter 23 verse 7 says this, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. The, the thinking that you possess, how you think about life, will determine. How, what you believe will determine how you behave whether you're going to be conformed to this world or be transformed by God. Back to the scripture text, verse 2, the first part of it, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. J.B. Phillips' translation describes it this way, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold, but let God remold your mind's from within. The, the mind is the battle. That's, that's why you have to present yourself to him. That's why you have to let him saturate everything in the mind and how you view life. Now let's divide these a little bit in two ways. First of all, let's describe and define for you what it means to be conformed. Conformed. Um, Ellie and I, sometimes she'll say, Papa, I want to play with some Play-Doh. And so we'll get her up in her high chair and we've got these little like cookie cutter deals and you make stars and moons and different things. Sometimes I've even rolled the Play-Doh up, made my own little snake and hiss and different things. And, and so we'll do this. And what you do, you're, you're squeezing it into a mold. And sometimes we think that peer pressure is just for like kids or teenagers. Uh, last weekend I went into, walked into the doors of Glenver Elementary and met the principal there and we talked and went on and went around and saw some of the work that they were doing there at Glenver Elementary. It reminded me about because back in the 80s, I did my student teaching at Glenver Elementary. And so it, this flood of memories just came back to my mind. But the pressures that kids face in elementary school or middle school or high school are not just pressures 
that they have at their stage of life. Until the day we die, we'll, we'll always have this cultural perception, this, this mold that the world is trying to craft into us, partly because of just our culture. They view life differently. It's a different worldview, partly because of our human flesh, partly because of the devil and his angels that try to influence our lives. All these different things that we realize we're constantly being squeezed into the world's mold. The vacations that you take, the things that you enjoy, the hobbies and interests that you have, are we're being inundated with things from our culture. Um, I was reminded of this the other day, and I, I don't do a whole lot of shopping, and I'll tell you why in just a minute, but I, I went into uh, Tractor Supply, and I was just walking around. I had a few minutes to kill, and I was walking around Tractor Supply, and as I walked around, I said, well, well I don't have that, and I don't have that, and... I don't have that. Oh, that tractor out front, that looks really nice and different things. And I realized why I shouldn't go shopping very often because I realized all the things that I don't have. Have you ever done that? Like, I didn't even, before I started shopping, I didn't even know I needed that. Now I need that. <laughs> We're getting squeezed into this mold, whether it's sexuality or alcohol or drugs or different things that we're getting squeezed into the world's mold. And it's an external pressure that happens. But then there is not only being conformed, there is, there is this being transformed. And just as peer pressure is external, transformation is internal. Transformation is what happens that when you saturate your mind with, with the work of the Spirit and the Word of God ends up forming your mind so that the very thing that you identified at the outset of this service, your selfishness. Your pride, your anger, your worry, whatever it might be for you and whatever it is for me, that how we believe and how we saturate our minds with the Word of God has the potential to change that. So how do you get transformed? Well, it's, just, it's what you do and choose to do. You know, if I, I, I've said this before, and I hate to be redundant, but if you spend more time on Facebook rather than in the faith book, then don't be surprised that you're conformed rather than transformed. Many of you as kids, and somehow we lose sight of this, but we ought to be saturating our minds with the Word of God. Do you remember what it says in Psalm 119.11? Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against God. And it's talked about in Psalm 1. Uh, who, who's the person that's blessed? Who is the person that believes and leads to the right kind of behavior? Uh, we look at Psalm 1. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and he meditates on that law day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in all that he does, he prospers. So you can be transformed by the Spirit of God and the Word of God. Take the area that you're struggling with that needs transformation, and you just need to memorize some Bible verses. All right? God, I'm an angry person. I need to memorize texts that do. Maybe you're dealing with a pornography addiction. Maybe you just need to memorize texts like Colossians chapter 3, 1 and 2. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. I have found every time I go back, and sometimes it's just been an in general idolatry. I'm just, you know, and I've memorized passage on what it means to have idols in my life. Whatever it is, whatever corresponds, that's how God works in terms of our lives and changes the perspective and the fabric of how we look at life. There's, a, there's this uh, imperative that we have in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, that says this, Take every thought captive to obey Christ. That, that ought to be the starting point. That we say every single day, I want to offer my body everything about who I am to you as a living sacrifice so that I can bring myself to behave the way that Christ wants me to behave, that he can transform my life. So number one, transformation bases itself on the mercies of God, responds uh, as an act of worship, depends on the renewal of your mind. Fourth thing is this, is progressing in the will of God. Progressing in the will of God. I, I've changed over the last few years with my understanding of um, the will of God. In fact, I had a lady that called me a few weeks ago, and she said, uh, Pastor Ken, she said, uh, I am so scattered right now. She said, uh, my husband is an alcoholic. My young adult son won't work. 
my mother-in-law is, is causing this codependency and she's not, she's housing him in different things. And she went on and on describing. And she said, I'm just trying to get back right with God. I'm trying to seek and discover God's will. What, what, what is your perception of how you discover God's will? What's the first thing that you do when you're trying to discover? How can God transform my life? How can I discover who to marry, where to go to school, uh, what it is that I'm to do each day, what I'm to be a part of, different things in, in regard to your life? Second part of verse 2, that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. There's not a one of you in here that you don't want to know what God's will is for your life. Because you know deep down that you're not happy and fulfilled as a person until you're in the center of God's will. The New English Bible phrases it this way. It says, then you will be able to discern the will of God and to know what is good and acceptable and perfect. I, I used to do this. In fact, I preached a message here back years ago. Ten steps to discovering God's will. And one of those was obviously, you know, does it jive with the Word of God? Do you have peace about the decision? Have you made a list of pros and cons? All these different things. And I, I'm not negating that those things God can't use. But I have come to this conclusion as I've thought about God's will. God's will never starts with a plan. It always starts with a person. Jesus. It starts... By focusing in our, our lives and saying, I have been given so many mercies. God has changed and transformed my life. He sacrificed himself on Calvary's cross. I've offered my body to him. He's transformed me by the renewal of my mind. And so it always starts with the person. God, as you long to know him and to know his will and plan for your life, he offers to you not only his gift of salvation, but he offers to you this. The transformation and the renewal of your mind. And it's not just a nice thing to say in church by a preacher that has a message to give. It can become a reality because I've seen things change in my own life. Attitudes, actions, vices, addictions in my own life. And it can do the same in your life as well. Back, back to the story of the snake that I started the service with. Every, every one of us, we have some kind of little snake inside us some kind of uh, mischief something that's poisonous to us something that seems to get the best of us and God waits and says you know you need to start this way not just try to clean up your behavior not just try to get your act together not just go through some counseling but start with my goodness and grace shown through Jesus and if you get the order right, he can change your life. He can change that worry into trust. He can change that, that thought pattern into something that's God glorifying. He can bring about what it is that he desires to do in your life. The question is, will you let him? I want to pray for us in just a moment. We've got some people that are a part of our care and prayer team. I'm just going to ask if they would get up and and position themselves at different places around the room. And you'll see where they're going. Some of you may be closer to the back of the room. Some of you may be up closer to the front. But as I pray for you, you may need to pray, someone to pray with you. And we want to pray with you. Because whatever the deal is that you're dealing with, health concerns, frustrations, difficulties, the only answers can be found in the Word of God and the work of the Spirit in your life. And it's a humbling process to take somebody by the hand and say, I'm struggling in this and my marriage isn't going well or I'm having a tough time. I seem to worry all the time. But, you know, God can change every aspect of our lives. And after I lead us in a word of prayer, we're going to stand and maybe the response that you need to make is just say, yeah, I need to acknowledge this. I need to pray. I need to deal with it. Because God loves us so much. Jesus has given a revelation of himself. He wants to journey with you. But it comes from the moment of surrender. So let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the transforming power that you offer to us. And I ask that you would transform 
anything that's outside of your will and your plan in our lives, transform it by your power. We look to you. We humble ourselves before you. We call upon your supernatural change to take place in our lives. And we ask it in Jesus' strong and powerful name. Amen. Let's stand together as we